Okay, welcome to week three of our Intro to Philosophy class. For this week, we read Descartes' Meditations 1 and 2. Um, there are six meditations in total. We read the first two because they're sort of like the most famous and most important. Um, they are the meditations in which we get the method of doubt from Descartes, and we also get um, the beginnings, uh, the underpinnings, the important moves that uh, help him to establish his epistemological system of uh, being able to do science, uh, being able to reason about the world, uh, eventually proving God's existence. We won't talk about the, the proof for God in this class. That'll come later in the semester. Um, but it's a really super influential work in philosophy. If, if Western philosophy uh, begins uh, most famously with Plato's Apology, uh, it really kicks off with Descartes' Meditations and the Cogito, which we see in, in today. So before we get into that, um, a few administrative notes. Um, so just for everybody online, the way that I take attendance, just as a reminder, um, at a random point during the lecture, I'll take a screenshot of everybody who's uh, in the, the Zoom call. And then I use that as my attendance. It could happen early, it could happen late, it could happen anytime. So um, whatever your status is in, out, camera on, off, whenever the screenshot gets taken is what your grade is um, for that bit of attendance points. Now. About attendance, generally, I've had a few questions. It's not required. You're not counted against. That's true of every grade in this class, right? Every single grade is optional. You choose what you want to do, what works best for you to earn the grade that you want to earn, whether that be taking tests, showing up, writing on the discussion board, doing write-ups, or any mixture of those. Um, does anybody have any questions about now that we've like settled in, right? Like we're a few weeks deep into the class. We have been really active on the discussion boards, which is great. Um, and I've had a bunch of really good write-ups as well. Does anybody have any questions about course logistics? It, just, you know, double checking that we're all okay. Online, doing good. So we don't have questions, but are, are we doing good? No, yes, hello. Okay, good, excellent. Um, if you do end up with questions, reach out to me through email. Um, I feel like there was something else. Oh yeah, next week, um, there'll be no live Zoom recording. Uh, it's my birthday, so I'm gonna go out of town. I'll pre-record lecture, I'll post it on YouTube. Um, I'll probably do it, I don't know, probably tomorrow, sometime. Um, but I'll post it before I leave, I'm leaving Saturday. So I'll have to do it tomorrow. So sometime tomorrow, next week's lecture will appear on YouTube. Um, and then after that, back to normal business will be in person, in Zoom, asynchronous, whatever you wish. Um, but for September 16th, no in-person class. Um, was there another administrative thing I needed to remember? I don't think so. Oh. Yeah, I uploaded the Lao Tzu reading. So that reading for uh, Mengzi, Shunzi, and Lao Tzu is pretty long. It's like 26 pages. Um, so read it all if you're into it. Um, if that ends up being too long, it's okay if you just choose like one of them. Really, it's best to read two to do a comparison. And if you read any two, read the Mengzi and the Shunzi. The Lao Tzu Tao Te Ching stuff is um, poetic and enigmatic. Um, so uh, really, you could treat the Lao Tzu reading as, as optional, um, but it is super cool. So I included it, and it'll be uh, an interesting foil to um, not just the is human nature good or bad debate, but in general, the debate about human nature sort of in, in itself. Um, okay, so that was all the administrative stuff. On to Descartes. Um, Cartesian revolution. So Descartes with the meditations. Um, and with much of the other work, uh, really shifts the way that um, science and thinking in general uh, was done um, from the period of Aristotle onwards through, say, like the Renaissance um, and forwards uh, until Descartes uh, appears on the scene. Um, the way that science had been done was, as we would see it now, pretty unscientific. 
a whole lot of uh, sense knowledge and tradition uh, and um, uh, appeal to um, authority are uh, important constituents of what would count as scientific knowledge of the time. You have what's called scholasticism um, and strange views of, su of substance and matter that um, don't really accord with the really good science that's going on at the time. And so what Descartes does in a really um, diplomatic way is invites the old Kaji thinkers, the, the boomers of his day to thinking well, and in this new scientific way that um, engages in materialistic scientific, as we understand it, rigor with experiment um, and uh, uh, coming to, to know things. So not just saying, well, it says in the Bible that this is the case. Like Dacre's like, whoa, hold on. We can still have um, a, a religious view of the world. We can still make our, our um, spiritual convictions consistent with the new science. Um, we don't have to uh, be the Galileo edge lords and get all, you know, like put under house arrest and threat of death for saying that, uh, yeah, it's actually the earth that revolves around the sun. Um, no, we can make these two views consistent. So really that the meditations is not just a project in um, philosophical and scientific rigor in uh, establishing a method of doubt in order to find out what certainty is and what knowledge counts as, uh, but it's also a, um, Historically, it's, it's a political text as well that's uh, inviting the synthesis of these, at what were um, in prior at odds with one another worldviews. That is the, the Aristotelian, uh, Neoplatonic, uh, largely religious uh, worldview and, and how to do science, the scholastics, the academics, and um, this new uh, material science. So it's a really important work, plus you get, I think, therefore I am, which everybody knows, like you haven't ever studied any philosophy, you know, cogito ergo sum. Um, so it has huge cultural impact as well. So here's Descartes, looking real pretty. He's called the father of modern philosophy. So we said like, well, Western philosophy started with Plato and Socratic apology, right? Well, no, really modern philosophy, um, as philosophy is done today, again, begins with Descartes for all the reasons I just mentioned. Um, he invented the coordinate plane. So you've taken a math class, right? You, you know this thing, it's called the Cartesian coordinate plane. You remember that? Cartesian, Descartes. Cartesian means Descartes thing. He invented that. He was a mathematician, he was a polymath. He um, did all sorts of interesting science and mathematics and logic and uh, theology and philosophy, all of it, right? He was also a cognitive scientist. He drew this, a couple of creepy looking eyeballs making triangles into the world. Um, he studied vision and how uh, uh, imagination and perception are supposed to work in the optics uh, and has some overlaps of philosophical views with his um, cognitive science work as well. He was an astronomer and a geologist. Studied the earth and said, hey, look, it, it, it's in layers. Um, so the rise of the new science. Some years ago, says Descartes, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted in my childhood and by, by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundations if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. So what's he saying here? This is how the meditations begins. What Descartes is, is telling us is, you know, I got to be about 50 and I started to think, well, why do I really believe the things that I do? Why, why do I hold the convictions that I hold? Well, you know, those teachers that I had told me I should think this and that, and um, they seemed pretty smart and convincing. And I live in the world in a way that mostly works. And so I, I acquire beliefs based on that sort of practical or pragmatic form of, of operation in my, my daily um, every day. And it, it, I've done okay so far. Um, but now that I'm kind of middle-aged and looking back, I, I, I can't really say, says Descartes, why it is that I believe what I do. Why it is that these beliefs are 
actually justified. Our beliefs worth holding are not to be contradicted, are not to be lost in um, uh, some alternative, better, superior set of beliefs. Um, so what I want to do is to throw all that away. I'm going to pretend as if, or I'm going to try my very best to pretend as if I don't hold any of these beliefs whatsoever and restart from ground zero. So you get a whole lot in like the popular culture surrounding Descartes, uh, a misunderstanding in the same sort of way that um, Socrates is misunderstood as the only thing I know is that I know nothing at all, right? That it's not right. It's that he doesn't claim to have knowledge that he doesn't actually have. That's the Socratic injunction. Similar with Descartes, he's not a skeptic trying to wash away the, the, the world. He's not trying to like wipe the sun from the horizon with a sponge, right? He's, and, and you know, sit in the empty blank space. He's He's using this, um, this throwing out all of his beliefs as a tool in order that he can do science, do real solid believing, build a set of beliefs and of knowledge essentially that um, can move him forward. So his skepticism is not universal, it's hypothetical and it's used as a tool or a method in order to produce knowledge, knowledge that's certain, knowledge that um, can do him well in the world and for the world itself. So he's also clarifying that he's not saying that anybody's wrong or ignorant or in any way questioning authorities. He's saying like, look, I, I'm not saying that the church um, is ha, has uh, led me wrong. I'm not saying that the academy has led me wrong. I'm not saying that you guys are, are full of crap. Uh, I'm just saying that, look, I, I, I respect what you've taught me. I'm going to set it aside for now and see if I can build up a system that will reclaim quite a lot of that. Um, and this is to be opposed with, like, like I said, Galileo was kind of an edgelord. Galileo was uh, a contemporary of, of Descartes. Um, and the way that he did his science and writing was um, inflammatory and said like, look, you guys are dumbasses. You, you say that because it's written in the Bible, it must be true, but I have scientific evidence. I have empirical experimental proof that shows that some of your theorems and proofs and stuff are, are just like incorrect. The world actually works like this. Um, and uh, for his, well, actually attitude, Galileo is uh, put in a lot of trouble. The Inquisition and the church, um, basically cause him to stop doing science. They say, look, you stay in your house and you stop writing stuff or we're gonna kill you. And uh, Galileo stopped. This is to be contrasted with Descartes' much more uh, friendly method, not questioning or really attacking authority, but it um, saying like, look, I'm just gonna sort of sidestep these problems with authority and, and do it my own way and show you that the way that I'm doing is really the way that you wanna do it as well. Um, so he's going to start from philosophical scratch to make sure that we have the real truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So knowledge is justified true belief. This is sort of, uh, the mainstay of epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, logos, meaning principle of, uh, episteme, meaning knowledge or stuff of the head. So the logos of Episteme, epistemology is the principles of knowledge. What is knowledge? Um, think biology, bios, life, logos, principles of principles of life. Um, so a mainstay of uh, epistemology historically and even today is that knowledge is justified true belief. That you have a belief, you have some sort of propositional attitude, a, a, a sentence in your head, a, a, a way that the world is. Uh, there is a table in front of me, right? Uh, that is just, it's a proposition, it's a sentence, it's a belief. Um, do I know that there's a table in front of me? Well, I've constructed a belief. I haven't just said like two, three, four, five. That is nonsensical. It doesn't really mean anything. It can't be given uh, 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 truth value, true false. Um, but my propositional statement, there's a table in front of me, can be. So it's a belief. Um, it turns out it's true as far as I know. And I know it's true because I can justify my belief that there's a table in front of me, like I've been banging it with my hand. Um, so I can empirically say like, look, there is actually a table in front of me. This justifies the truth of my belief. And therefore I know that there's a table in front of me. 
This is a controversial definition. Uh, it's one that um, Plato shows to be controversial in the Theotetus. If you take an epistemology course, you'll read about half a hundred papers about fake barns and um, other strange epistemological objects uh, like clocks that don't tell time correctly that would show you why justified true belief is not uh, a sufficient definition of knowledge. But anyways, let, it's, we'll, we'll take it as um, sort of standard and as a helpful first tool. So at the very least, we need to explain what we know and why we know it. And this is what science is all about, right? It's about justifying beliefs to show that they're true, such that we can say, look, I know that such and such. But there's a problem, which is the regression of justification. So why should we accept a conclusion, for instance, that there's a table in front of me? Well, um, for reason X, that I banged on it and it made a sound. But why accept that um, my banging on it and uh, it made a sound is a good uh, reason to believe that there's a table in front of me? Well, normally when you hit objects that exist, they uh, produce uh, perceptual um, artifacts like sounds or whatever. Um, but this is an alternative, this is the next justification. So my justification for the belief that the truth is front is in, or that the, the table is in front of me um, is based upon uh, my hitting it. But then if we question why hitting it counts as a, a justification, then we need to justify that, that reason as well. It becomes its own sort of belief, truth-making belief that needs its own justification. And we could go ad infinitum, right? We can add more questions add more justifications and regress uh, forever. So we need some way of grounding our conclusions. We need a way to stop the question asking. We need a way to say, look, there's a foundational belief at the bottom that holds up the superstructure of the rest of my um, set of beliefs. Right? Does this make sense? That, that what we need is a, a, a way to stop, something that stops the regression of, of the need for further justification, a belief that is uh, fundamental a priori that um, stands before all else that can be the you know first truth or whatever something of that sort. We need a foundation. So Descartes uses this metaphor in his other writing. It's also just super helpful. We can think of uh, building. Um, so when you're building a structure, you set the foundation first. You build. You pour the concrete. You um, reinforce the concrete with rebar, you make it so that it's unshakable, indefatigable, right? That it, it cannot be broken because this is the ground upon which the rest of your castle is built. The castle built on stone versus the one on sand, the one on sand crumbles away. Uh, and Descartes going to show that a lot of our beliefs are built on sand. And really what we need is this strong, solid foundation, this concrete with reinforced rebar that is immovable, that, um, we need that kind of foundation in order to have actual knowledge to justify our true beliefs. And then there's superstructure, right? So you have your foundation, that upon which the superstructure is built. The foundation is the ground floor, the very beginning, the, the first justification, that, that place where the regress can stop. And then our superstructure beliefs are the, the set, the web, the form of uh, inferences that hold together with one another to uh, build a worldview, an interpretation, a, a whole consistent set of uh, uh, propositional attitudes, the sentences, right, that we might say constitutes um, a way of living in the world, right? So foundation is going to look like principles, like axioms, postulates, taken science classes. I'm sure you've talked a lot about these principles, axioms, postulates. Um, you, know, you have uh, Euclidean ge geometry, I think, is a really helpful um, example for postulates because you have to postulate an axiom. You have to say, uh, assume this. And then based on this set of assumptions, you get a full system of uh, corresponding superstructural um, notations, beliefs, uh, and uh, proofs for you know, like how circles work and stuff. Um, but then the superstructure is, again, the proofs, the theorems, right? So you, you have your axioms, and then you mix and match the axioms using rules of inference that you can then prove with those axioms um, in order to build out more complex uh, 
uh, propositions, beliefs, theorems, right? So here's Descartes saying it, in order for knowledge to be perfect, it must be deduced from first causes, foundations. Right? Thus, in order to set about acquiring it, and it is this activity to which the term to philosophize strictly refers, meaning to philosophize is to seek the truth, is to seek first principles and foundations. We must start with the search for first causes or principles. These principles must satisfy two conditions. First, they must be so clear and evident that the human mind cannot doubt their truth when it attentively concentrates on them. And secondly, the knowledge of other things must depend on them in the sense that the principles must be capable of being known without knowledge of these other matters, but not vice versa. Next, in deducing from these principles the knowledge of things which depend on them, we must try to ensure that everything in the entire chain of deductions which he draws is very manifest. Basically, what he's describing here is what we might call logical thinking, right? That you start with a sound first principle, sound axiom, postulate, whatever, uh, and then uh, we know that that axiom is true in itself and uh, can justify the proofs that are to follow from it, but it doesn't require those proofs to be true or justified itself. Otherwise it would be circular, right? This is what we call in philosophy a circular argument, viciously circular, um, begging the question is the, the name of the fallacy here. It's where you assume the conclusion in your, your premises so that as you develop the argument, the proof or theorem, the conclusion that you want comes out because you already had it at the beginning, but it's circular. You've just looped back on yourself. You haven't shown anything at all. Um, so what he's saying here is, look, we have to have some first principle that can give us proofs and theorems that doesn't require those proofs and theorems, um, that stands in the right sorts of relation to those proofs and theorems in order to justify them, meaning that they don't just stand alone and float without the proper, like, logical causal connection to their first principles. Um, and what's the other one I have them highlighted? Uh, we can't doubt the truth of, of our foundations, that our foundations are indubitable, even if themselves not justified by any alternative or other principles, they are indubitable. So what Descartes is going to do in the meditations is look for just such a principle or a set of principles. He's going to try to give us first principles that are indubitable, justify the rest of our uh, uh, beliefs, as long as they're well-formed, um, and those first principles, those foundations, don't need um, their own justifications. They stand alone, indubitably. Right? So our first principles, God bless you, must be free from uncertainty. Our first principles are the source of uh, justification, um, right? They're the, the, the beginning of inquiry. Um, and the foundations are self-evident. They can't otherwise be justified. Um, they simply justify themselves. Okay, so an example of a foundation is that an axiom is that we can't get something from nothing. This is just taken as true. Or of a superstructure, body is extension, mind is intention, not intention in the sense of um, like, I want to go to the store, uh, so I will go to the store. Like I intend to do something. Intention in philosophy, uh, in, especially in philosophy perception means something different, means representational quality. So uh, insofar as I think about something, so if I like imagine it um, or if I see it, uh, there's like an imprint of that object in my mind. I'm, I'm not seeing this actual thing out in the world, the water bottle, but um, there's, like a representation in my mind of a water bottle when I'm stimulated perceptively. That's like intentionality in the philosophical sense. So mind being intention or body's extension, these are um, superstructural beliefs, example of, right? Um, that would follow from uh, uh, axioms or principles. So the old science foundations, as I mentioned, uh, based on authority, tradition, um, and sense knowledge are to be questioned. For Descartes, these are no good. They're, they don't satisfy the right sort of foundation. They're dubitable. They're not um, uh, completely certain. So we need an unshakable foundation. So what do we do? Uh, we replace the foundation. We, we replace the foundation that was based on authority, tradition, and sense knowledge with one that does us much better. One that um, is about self-evidence, indubitability, and, and first principles. So what would count as an unshakable belief that could satisfy or form this kind of foundation. What Descartes is gonna do is 
blow up the superstructure of beliefs based on this old building, right? Um, he's going to blow up the old building um, with skeptical arguments and then try to rebuild that superstructure after finding what lies beneath all of that rubble and crap that he's going to throw out. And he does this with the method of doubt. Throughout my writing, says Descartes, I've made it clear that my method imitates that of the architect. When an architect wants to build a house which is stable on the ground when there's only sandy topsoil over underlying rock or clay or some other firm base, he begins by digging out a set of trenches from which he removes the sand and anything resting on or mixed with the sand so that he can lay his foundations on firm soil. In the same way, I began by taking everything that was doubtful and throwing it out, like the sand. And then when I noticed that it was, it was impossible to doubt that a doubting or thinking substance exists, spoiler alert, uh, I took this as the bedrock upon which I could lay the foundations of my philosophy, okay? So here's him describing this, this project. We're gonna try to find foundations. We gotta get rid of all that sandy loose soil so we get our first principles. But before we do this, we're gonna play a game, which is uh, very conveniently acronymized as PSDTKTWD. TKLFO or philosophy students, what do they know things? What do they know? Let's find out. Okay. So we're, we're going to play a game. Um, take two minutes. Come up with one thing you know. Come up with a justification or a reason that explains how you know that thing. And then I'll try to show you that you don't actually know it. I've played this game a lot and I haven't been stumped yet. Um, so good luck. Uh, I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, so recording is resumed. Uh, who wants to go first? What do you know? Do you know things? Let's find out. The sky is blue. The sky is blue. And how do you know it? How do I know it or why do we as people know that? How do you know it? Justify your belief. The sky is blue. You see that it's blue. Okay, so um, we can do perceptual knowledge doubts this way. Uh, the sky isn't always blue. Sometimes it's green, sometimes it's gray. Sometimes it's pink. So when we perceive, what happens is light bounces off of an object and then hits our eye, right? The brain through the occipital lobe then processes that visual data, thus representing color, features, shape, extension, right? Um, so when we say the sky is blue and well, I see it, uh, what your belief is based on is old data, right? It, it happens really fast, but it's old, it's a few milliseconds. How do you know it's still blue? Couldn't it change? The sky's changed color before. Sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's gray. Okay, sky's blue. What else? What do we know? I know that I experience pain. You know that you experience pain. So th these ones are more tricky. Um, when it comes to personal effective states. Is that because it's more subjective? Yeah. Um, so what's a good way of doing this? Um, you know that you feel pain. We can do the Socratic thing, I suppose. What do you mean by pain? That's hard, yeah. you, you say you feel it, you must know what it is. Something that hurts. Something that hurts. <laughs> so when, uh, when I watch my favorite sports team uh, lose uh, to an underdog, I might exclaim that hurts. And, and we would say that that sentence makes sense and it's true, right? And likewise, if you were to kick me in the knee, I might say, oh, that hurts. And we'd say that makes sense and that's true. But those sentences, those kinds of hurt are two very different sorts, are they not? Yeah. And so how do you know that you are in pain uh, if pain can mean so many things? What sort of pain are you in? I mean, and can be, can you be certain it's not the other sort? 
can be multiple sorts of ones. Sure. There's also, uh, philosophy of pain is kind of interesting. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, debate on this issue in general too. So think about a, an amputee who's say like lost their arm and they have a ghost pain. Um, you might say that they are feeling actual pain, but then the nerve fibers that would cause pain aren't firing themselves. And so if pain is supposed to be, uh, if all affective mental states reduce to um, physical states, uh, there's no physical state that corresponds to the mental state. And so it's, in the case of ghost pain, um, incomprehensible. It's not a, a real thing. If, if you are a reductive materialist about mental states. So there's, there's another way of doing it too. Um, Bryce, what do you know? I know that I know nothing because anything I claim to know can be easily disproven or you can prove that I don't know it. You know that you know nothing is a contradiction. That doesn't mean anything. It's like saying P and not P, right? It's nonsense. Two is purple. You know that you know very little. You know that you know very little. Um, how do you know that you know very little? Justify yes, it. I can, well, because like we're doing, I can argue with myself about most things and find that there's doubt in them. And the number of things that I can prove I don't know is much greater than the things that I can prove that I do. Okay. So you can prove that you know things. Um, and you can also prove that you don't know things. And the former is smaller than the latter, right? That you, the number of proofs for things you know is less. How do you prove something you don't know? If you don't know it, how do you, how do you even talk about it? Well, I think the proof that I don't know for sure, like, I've raised doubt about everything. Is that what it means? I'm confusing myself now. If you don't know something, how do you? prove that you don't know it. If it's not in your head, if it's not floating around, how can you form a proof, put it into um, a theorem, right? That says that you don't know it if it doesn't actually exist in your head. Well, there's a difference between knowing about something and knowing something. Like you can know about a possible proof, but not know that it's true. Like I can think about it without uh, knowing there's a difference between knowing and thinking for sure. The question is, what do you know? Well, okay, now I know. Um, I'm saying that I can think of these thoughts and then like disprove them or doubt them. I see. So there, there are many thoughts which are dubitable and far fewer which are indubitable. Right. And are you sure that Those indubitable thoughts are actually indubitable? I mean, only in so much as the card is, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so if you can doubt those two, then it seems as if you don't know anything. And if you know that you know very little in, in this sense, um, then that would be dubitable as well. Sure. Okay. What else? Who, who else we got? So I know that, oh, just kidding. Uh, we'll do Hawken next. You know that colors exist? You know that colors exist. <clears throat> know that colors exist. And how do you know that colors exist? Because you perceive them. them. And you can think of them. Dream of them. There may be more colors. 
Cool. Okay. So here's like a kind of scientific realism where what I'm assuming is going on is when you, you, you know, like blue exists or red exists, right? Okay, so these are uh, metaphysical tropes. They're concepts, they're um, static, and we know that that metaphysical trope exists because we can see reference of it in the actual world. Um, so there's, there's, I think, two ways to do this well. Um, the type and token distinction. So the, the type is blue, the concept. The token are a bunch of blue objects, right? Um, but every shade of blue is a little bit different, right? Um, and every token of blue uh, might share a similarity in light spectrum, but um, is blueness in general? Doesn't seem so. For instance, uh, draw a triangle, right? And uh, you'll never have an exactly perfect triangle. Uh, even um, if you do it on a computer, zoom, zoom in enough, um, and things will start to get weird and pixelated. You have what we extrapolate from an imperfect version, from the imperfect token to the perfect type. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, there's another way. Uh, I don't think I quite understand that. Uh, no? The, sure, so the-, the, the colors, Because obviously we can't make a perfect triangle. Perfect yeah, triangle. Nor can you make a perfect a 2D, blue net. It's a 2D triangle, it doesn't exist. Yeah, so, so for blue, um, there's, there's two ways of understanding blue. One way would be to say any instance of blue is, is a, that is a blue that I know. Um, and another would be all of the different blue objects in this room, cyan, sea foam, dark blue, light blue, whatever, are all taking part in the form of blue, uh, but they're all different. So how do you know that they're what, what makes them the same if they're all different shades themselves? What, what's the common property of blue? And then where does that common property exist in the world if every instance, every token is not an exact replica or um, uh, make of the type, the concept blue? Are you saying each individual shade of a color is something different other than a color? Yeah, exactly. Then when we have two different definitions of color? Right, so then the alternative is to say, look, there's a fine-grained um, notion of blue. Uh, and when I say like, I point at an object, I say that's blue. But then I point at a different object that we might all in normal parlance call blue as well. I say, no, 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 that's, that's not blue. It's just this particular shade that I'm pointing at right now. Um, so that, that's a, a way of uh, getting around this, this issue. And what we could say about that is um, the stability of it. Right. So if we want to be fine grained about what we mean about blue and, and it only um, uh, pertains to a particular object in the world, right? Um, you could say, well, how do you know that it continues to be blue? Um, that it, it has this property indefinitely and is the actual perfect representation, the, the perfect token of the fine grained type that, that we're calling blue. Um, we'll talk about this. Uh, in two or three weeks, um, Hume's problem of induction. So the problem of induction uh, is just that uh, we assume based on induction that uh, natural properties are consistent and will continue. So um, that the sun will rise tomorrow, I say I know or is true because it's risen every day before. Um, and so will continue to rise. And, and I know that um, the sun has risen every day before because yesterday it rose and the day before that it rose and the day before that it rose and the day before that it rose and N plus one days it rose. The N plus one day is the inductive step as you're saying like, well, I assume because it's risen this many days um, that it, has risen every other day before that. Um, but that inductive step is uh, an absconce uh, stepping away from reason. It's having a superstructural belief that is not rightly causally connected to its first principles. Um, and turns out that all scientific thinking is based on induction. Any like scientific study requires uh, an inductive step in order to say like, this is a generalizable property. Um, so all of our scientific thinking is probabilistic rather than strictly deductive. So in the case of fine-grained color, 
um, I say that's blue. Uh, and I know it's blue because every time I look at it, it's been the same instance, the same token of the type of the fine grained color that we're talking about. But we're making an inductive step when we say that that is the same as the concept, that I know that that's um, what I mean it to be, uh, because every time you look at it, it appears in the same way. So the problem of induction um, applied here shows us that we don't actually know that the token is the type. It requires um, a moment of induction, a step away from pure deductive rationality to um, say that in every instance and in every moment that we look at it, it still represents uh, the concept blue as we understand it. Hawken. So mine is also on the side of science where under standard conditions, iron is magnetic, but. Under standard conditions, uh, iron is magnetic. And we know this because. Because you can justify it. Test it. Because you can test it. And, and, test it. and um, you use the temperature where it becomes non-magnetic. Yeah, good. So again, problem of induction here, that just because every time we've done this test doesn't mean that it will continue to uh, empirically work in the same sort of way. Uh, for instance, I say that all swans are white because I've seen 10 million swans and all of them have been white. Um, that doesn't mean that all swans are white. I assume, and so I, I say that there is a law that um, holds that all swans are white, but this requires a step of induction. There could be a black swan, right? It's not a logical impossibility on the basis of my empirical observation that all swans are white, but I say so just to get the scientific publication and you know be able to live well in the world. So where does knowledge develop then? I mean, science is built off the shoulders of giants, right? So at some point you have to be able to build off of it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what we're missing is firm foundations and the giants upon which should, the, the shoulders, the shoulders of giants. Yeah, De, it's Descartes' shoulders. That's what confused way of saying it. I know philosophy quite literally means love for wisdom. You know philosophy means love for wisdom. Um, because philos, and Sophos. Um, what's a different way of doing this than we've done so far? Okay, so say someone who is unaware of the Greek roots of the word philosophy. Um, is studying philosophy and has read Descartes and Plato, uh, would you say that they know what philosophy is? I'd say they have a very brief understanding. Say they've read all of the philosophers that have ever written anything, but they haven't studied the Greek roots. Does that person know what philosophy is? Based on the definitions of what every other person defines philosophy as. I see. So philosophy is a word that can have multiple definitions. Good. So do we know that it means love of wisdom and only love of wisdom? Could it mean other things as well? So when, when we use the word philosophy, do we know that we're, we mean love of wisdom or could we also mean having read all of the philosophers that's ever written anything? You know that there is space between you. Okay, th this is a good one. Um, most modern scientific thinking is based on, or bases its conception of truth on uh, theory from Bertrand Russell, truth by correspondence. So I say uh, it's true that uh, the cat is on the mat. Um, there has to be a cat that's actually on a mat in the world. Um, so there is an object, the cat on the mat, uh, a sentence or a propositional attitude about that object in the world, uh, a sense or a direction, right? That when I'm saying there's a cat on a mat, 
it, I'm like this, the propositional attitude is pointed at the object in the world. And then they correspond that there actually is a cat on a mat and that my, my sentence with the sense does appropriately map onto the quality of the world. Now, space is an interesting one. So when you say that uh, I know that there's a space between me and this table, presumably, like the, the sentence, there is a cat on the mat, there should be a reference, an object in the world to which that um, sentence points at, makes true, right? But space is the absence of objects. So how can the absence of something be a thing? I see. So we perceive that, um, that there is a table there and me here, and the stuff in between is space. Um, and the justification is perception. So um, again, we could do like the old perceptual data argument that maybe the table's blinking right in, um, no more space. Uh, Descartes had a theory of space that said space was thick. So there's no such thing as space. It's all just matter and uh, differently spread out and constituted. Um, so uh, if that thinking is valid, if not sound, it might be valid that space is thick with energy or something. Um, what we conceive of as space is not really space, but there's an extension of table to you just that we don't perceive it. And if we're basing our beliefs of, of what we know on perception, then um, you know, sticks and water are bent, but they're not actually, right? One plus two is three. One plus two is three. Um, so this one I had in my notes too. Um, there's two ways of doing this. I already did the truth by correspondence. So the idea is uh, for mathematical objects, there's no reference to point to. So when you make the claim two plus two is four, two plus one is three, um, what do you, what's the referent that corresponds to the object or, or to the, the proposition such that there can be a correspondence that doesn't exist unless you commit to some very strange abstract formalism about the existence of numbers and floaty space. Um, that's, that's one way of doing it. I, I before class, um, wrote up a different one. So if any of you are familiar with Gödel's incompleteness theorem, this is like a really fun philosophy thing. Um, mathematics, uh, are incomplete, indecidable, um, can't halt, incomputable. Um, and this causes all sorts of recursion, regression problems. Uh, look up a YouTube video. In fact, if you guys know Veritasium, Veritasium has a really good YouTube video on um, incompleteness. Uh, super interesting stuff, and he makes it really accessible. But uh, the idea is that, say we have, and I'll write this on the board here, say we have a set of axioms. So if phi, then, if phi, then psi, and what's the other one? If phi, then if psi, then chi, yeah. Psi, then chi, phi, then psi, phi, then this is going to look like a bunch of gobbledygook, but um, it is illustrative once we work through it. It's a little smaller. And then not psi and not phi and not psi, not phi, then. Good, okay. These three axioms, postulate one, two, and postulate three, are all that you need in order to do all basic mathematics. Um, in order to do more complex stuff, you need more uh, postulates uh, in order to like name objects and get real funky, but th this, these three logical statements that are gobbledygook to you guys, I'm sure, um, are what you need to do basic mathematics. That's it, period, done, right? Um, this is the foundation of propositional logic. Um, 
In fact, almost all simple communication is reducible to these three axioms as well. Um, these would be like the foundation that we're talking about upon which the superstructure of beliefs, or in this case of like sentences, uh, would uh, be reducible to, right? So everything that I'm saying right now is a bunch of uh, statements that can be reduced down into um, logical terms, mathematical objects or entities, and then explained in terms of uh, these plus rules of inference. So mix these around and you can create just about any sentence minus naming objects and, and things and, and whatnot. Um, so incompleteness. What incompleteness says is that you cannot use these axioms to justify these axioms. That for any formalized system of mathematics or logic, the system or the, the postulates and axioms that sit at bottom cannot justify themselves. And so in order to say that these that this is like a valid and uh, complete, um, meaning that it is consistent with itself and, and doesn't contain any contradictions, um, set of postulates, you need an alternative set of postulates, uh, another second order logic or mathematics in order to prove this one. But then what justifies this second order logic? Well, a third order logic and so on. So all of our mathematics, uh, even if it mostly works, two plus one is three, um, is incomplete insofar as it's unjustified upon it. It's uh, not perfectly or decidably consistent with itself. We need some other alternative second order mathematics or system of logic in order to uh, justify it, and then that would need its own justification. We get the regression problem again. Okay, um, time for like maybe one more online. Anybody else? I think there's a couple in the chat. Death is inevitable. Um, yeah, yep. Rachel, you're right. <laughs> okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. I teach existentialism too, so that's an important one to. I needed to be cheered up a bit today, so. There you go. Yeah. Don't worry. It's coming for all of us. Okay. Um, I don't know that you are. Uh, okay, so now the, the question is, do, so you know that you are because you're thinking, you're doing Descartes' move. How would you disprove this one? Um, okay, so Descartes doesn't actually know that he is. There's just like an inner light that illuminates the idea, making it uh, incredibly clear, way clearer than any other idea. Uh, and in order for uh, him to prove that he has any sort of scientific knowledge at all. He needs to show that there are certain indubitable or um, uh, 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 what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, beliefs that are certain, certain beliefs that share the same sort of like inner illumination um, and that uh, God exists and God would not allow us to be deceived about the things that we find to be most clear. So um, again, relying on a um, uh, theistic ontology in order to prove that uh, the inner light isn't just another object of the evil demon. And Descartes' proof for God is an interesting, it's of my favorite form, it's ontological proof in his own unique way. Um, but that would be how you doubt it. You, you just doubt the God part and then you get the evil, evil demon. But this is to preempt pretty much all the rest of lecture. So um, that's a spoiler, I suppose, hopefully like a primer, if that made any sense. Um, but we'll, we'll dig into all of those concepts moving forward. Okay, um, rules, the meditations. Here we go. So the method of doubt, what Descartes is doing, as I said, is 
digging out the sand. He's going to build firm foundations, but this means that he has to doubt away everything that he's been taught so that he can rebuild from ground zero. So uh, usually Descartes trusts his sense knowledge, but sometimes he's deceived about sensory experiences. Objects look small when they're far away, like those people over in the field over there. They look a little itty bit like I could just pick them up and you know toss them around. But you know you, you get closer and they appear a lot bigger, and you can't actually pick them up and throw them around. Um, so the senses are sometimes deceptive, right? Sometimes sticks appear bent when in water, but really they're actually straight. So our eyes lie to us, right? So Descartes says, yet although the senses occasionally deceive us with respect to objects, which are very small or in the distance, there are many other beliefs about which doubt is quite impossible. I don't doubt the multimodally verified features of my experience. For instance, that um, uh, the, the multimodal just means that it's not just by sight. So stick in water, right. It appears bent, but then I touch it as well. And, and it, it like, you know, is straight as I touch it. So there's like a multi modality to my certainty that the stick is not in fact bent. Um, for example, that I'm here sitting by the fire, wearing a winter dressing gown, holding this piece of paper in my hands and so on. He paints such a cozy picture, right? There he is sitting by the fire in his dressing. He's like, you know, wearing a robe and there's a candle melting next to him as he's writing philosophy, armchair philosopher. And so we get the second doubt, right? That we can doubt like uh, single modality sense experiences, but the multi multimodal ones about like what counts as real and stuff that like I'm um, here sitting in front of the fire, that feels pretty real. There's a lot of like force in that sort of belief. So what about these kinds of beliefs that then I'm, I'm here? And we move on from the sensing doubt to the dreaming doubt. I know that I'm awake because I'm having an experience of sitting by the fire, watching this candle melt or whatever. So what if you're asleep? You could be dreaming that you're having an experience of whatever, sitting by the fire, watching the, the candle melt, sitting in lecture, listening to me drone on. Some dreams don't seem realistic while we have them, and some do. Even still, some dreams retain the feeling of having been realistic even after waking, that you can uh, dream that you did your math homework and then wake up and go to school and you get to class and think, damn it, I dreamt that, right? That this is like an actual thing, that, that people have very realistic dreams that appear and feel just as powerful with just as much um, what my advisor would call assertoric force um, has sort of like a like presence in the world sort of feeling. You can dream that sort of assertoric force, the presence of being in the world feeling, um, but you're not actually in the world. You didn't actually do the math homework. So here, Descartes says, look, I, I feel the reality of my sitting here by the fire, but I could very well be having one of those really spooky, weird dreams that um, feel very real. Ah, Descartes pat myself on the back, a brilliant piece of reasoning. As if I were not a man who sleeps at night and regularly has all the same experiences while asleep as mad men do while awake. Indeed, sometimes even more improbable ones. How often asleep at night am I convinced of just such familiar events that I am here in my dressing gown sitting by the fire when in fact I am lying undressed in bed? Risque. Yet at the moment, my eyes are certainly wide awake when I look at this piece of paper, I shake my head. And it is not, and it is not asleep as I stretch out my, and feel my hand. I do so deliberately, and I know what I'm doing. All this would not happen with such distinctness to someone asleep. Indeed, as if I did not remember other occasions when I have been tricked by exactly similar thoughts while asleep. As I think about this more carefully, I see plainly that there are never any sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. The result is that I begin to feel dazed. And this very feeling only reinforces the notion that I may be asleep. It's beautiful, right? It's the, the, the whole meditations is awesome. And like these little poetic asides as he you know, has little clever moments. Um, but here's saying, look, I can't distinguish with certainty, with assurity, the, the reality, the feeling of reality in my wakefulness versus that of being asleep. And so, even my presence here completely multimodally um, is dubitable. Nope, there you go. So my experience as it is, my understanding of reality of here we are, is it indubitable, unshakable? Well, not yet, says Descartes. So let's throw it out.
Oh, I did a lot of animations. Look at that. Wasn't that great? I don't remember doing that. Where'd it go? It's gone. Okay. You just get, oh, there it goes. Bye bye. Experience as it is. Dubitable. All right. The, um, the idea of pain kind of just cut that theory right in half. You can dream you're in pain, right? Yeah, but you can't actually experience pain. Yeah, so so again, I mean that the, the, the <laughs> if you wake up. Um so the, the again, this is like uh the reality of representation. That's uh if you take a philosophy of perception class, you might deal with this issue. Um Dustin Stokes and Peggy Batten. Peggy Batten is like super famous in literature on pain, um, but it's highly controversial, right? So interesting issue for sure. So um, we get the third doubt finally, right? So uh, I can doubt uh, my sense experiences, my simple sense experiences. I can doubt my experience as it is. So a reasonable conclusion says Descartes from all this might be that physics, astronomy, medicine, and all those other disciplines which depend on the study of composite things are doubtful. While arithmetic, geometry, and other subjects of this kind are mathematical realities, right? Um, which only deal with the simplest and most general things, regardless of whether they really exist in nature or not, right? He's not committing to some abstract platonic world where like two exists somewhere. Um, contain something certain and indubitable. For whether, am I, whether I'm awake or asleep, two and three add together to make five, and a square has no more than four sides. It seems impossible that such transparent truths should incur uh, any suspicion of being false. And Gödel wasn't around yet. Uh, so incompleteness theorem wasn't really, didn't exist. And they only had, I think, Euclidean geometry at this time. There's no like, yeah, like non-Euclidean space and geometry is something that was developed a couple hundred years after Descartes, I think. Don't quote me on that. So math and stuff, a priori knowledge. Um, a posteriori knowledge is after experience, it's the things that we gather through our senses, through empirical collection of data. A priori uh, just means the sorts of stuff that could be in your head without ever having experienced the world. So um, if you're just a mind, a brain in a vat that's never touched the world, and this is a philosophy thing too, um, a brain in a vat that's never touched the world, you would still be able to think two and two is four, right? You wouldn't need to know that um, paper is grainy in order for two and two to be four. It's a purely conceptual truth. It's a priori. So uh, we doubted away all of the out there in the world stuff, but what about the a priori rational just in the head stuff, math, and uh, the fact that uh, squares have four sides and triangles have internal angles adding up to 180 degrees, this a priori mathematical geometric knowledge. Well, says Descartes in the spirit of the third doubt, I shall suppose that some malicious, powerful, cunning demon has done all that he can to deceive me, rather than this being done by God, who is supremely good and the source of truth. Hedging. I shall think that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, and sounds, and all the external things are merely dreams that the demon has contrived as traps for my judgment. I shall consider myself as having no hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses, but as having falsely believed that I had all of these things. So this is the evil genius doubt, the evil demon doubt, um, depends on your translation. But the idea of this one is to say, look, is it, it does, does he believe that an evil demon exists, that this evil genius dude is like controlling his mind? Like, no, he doesn't, but it's a logical possibility. It is a possibility in logical space that he could be like mind control, that he could actually be the brain in the vat that's like being puppeted around. Um, he has no reason to actually believe this, but its possibility brings into doubt all of his other beliefs as well, right? Because like the game we played, there are, even if they're like trivial, pedantic, I mean, like, that's kind of like what I do in the game. Like I'm being pedantic and, you know, like um, goofy, but th they are reasons to doubt the beliefs, even in spite of all of the evidence that we might have, right? Like the, the books are blue, um, I, I keep looking at it every time and, and it remains blue, but do I know it? Well, I could just be convinced by an evil demon that it is when it's, the book is actually read or something. So as long as it's possible, 
the the beliefs that Descartes has, even about mathematical truths, like two and two is four, and internal angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, these are uncertain. They're still very certain, but they're uncertain. Right. So the evil genius uh, squeezes in uncertainty into even a priori mathematical beliefs. And so even these will not serve as a proper foundation of first principles upon which to build the superstructure of science beliefs and so on. So what's left? Oh. <laughs> so the three doubts. One, the sense doubt. We can doubt our sense knowledge. Two, the dreaming doubt, we can doubt scientific or empirical knowledge, reality. And three, the evil genius doubt, we can doubt all knowledge, including a priori knowledge. So um, we should see these as, as like ascending levels of doubt, that the, the sense doubt is sort of limited in scope. The dreaming doubt is more expanded in scope. It includes the sorts of things that are doubted by the sense doubt. And then the evil genius doubt is sort of universal. It's complete uncertainty about seemingly at this point, everything. Right. So what next? Well, we get the cogito, right? Descartes says, oh my goodness, all of this thinking makes me feel like I'm swirling in a whirlpool and I can't touch the bottom nor reach to the top for air, but I just have to keep going and see what comes. Yesterday's meditation raised doubts, ones that are too serious to be ignored, which I see no way of resolving. I feel like someone who is suddenly dropped into a deep whirlpool that tumbles around him so that he can neither stand on the bottom nor swim to the top. I, people don't write philosophy like this anymore. Reading contemporary philosophy is boring compared to this. This is awesome stuff. However, I shall force my way up and try. It on yesterday. Inside everything that admits of the slightest doubt, treating it as though I had found it to be outright false. So saying like, look, I still probably really think that two and two is four, but I'm going to force myself to set that belief aside. I'm not going to let my mind wander. I'm going to stick to the doubt. Anything that has any shred of uncertainty, we're going to set aside for now. And I'll carry on like that until I have found something certain, because what he's looking for is first principles. He doesn't want like pretty certain. He wants first principles certain, indubitable. Archimedes said that if he had one firm and immovable point, he could that he could lift the world with a strong enough lever. So too, I hope for great things if I can manage to just find one little thing that is solid and certain. So the cogito, the evil demon uh, controls our mind and deceives us. So I will suppose then that everything I see is fictitious because of this evil demon. I could be just, you know, total, I, the wool pulled over my eyes. I believe that my memory tells me nothing but lies, that I have no senses, right? What remains true? Perhaps just one fact that nothing is certain. So here's the argument of the cogito. This is like where we get the cogito ergo sum. Premise one, to doubt all of the above is not to doubt, or to doubt all of the above is not to doubt universally. There could be some indubitable thing which I've yet to realize. So Descartes saying, look, I've, I've doubted all sorts of stuff, but maybe there's still something. Premise two, if I'm the author of my own thoughts, then any further object of thought that I postulate is susceptible to the evil genius doubt, the demon doubt, insofar as my thinking is deceived universally. So whatever I continue to think, whatever I, I might come up with as the next uh, potential uh, first principle could also be um, shifted and uh, maligned by the evil demon, right? Therefore, I cannot think some further object which will, will remain free from doubt or from deception, that I can't just come up with the next thing because that could also be a part of the illusion. But there is something, the fact of deception, right? It's not that nothing exists and something can't come from nothing. This is a, a postulate, an axiom, something can't come from nothing. The fact of deception implies the existence of a thing being deceived, the cause of deception. This comes from our second conclusion and the third, the third premise. So Descartes says, even then, if he is deceiving me, I undoubtedly exist. Let him deceive me all he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing. Well, I think I am something. So after thoroughly thinking the matter through, I conclude the proposition I am, I exist, must be true whenever I think or assert it, right? So what's the idea here? Well, insofar as Descartes thinks, 
he's being deceived or could be being deceived, right? But the fact of his thinking is not an object of deception, right? The fact of his thinking is indubitable. Whatever object he thinks about could become dubitable, could become uh, maligned and mistreated, shifted in the illusion of the evil genius. But the fact of his thinking is, um, to Descartes at this point, certain. It has this sort of natural light that illuminates it, that shines upon it. It can't be doubted, even with the evil genius. Um, and if there is thinking, then there is a thinking thing. He exists. He is that thinking thing. So cogito, I think, ergo, therefore, sum, I am. I think, therefore, I am. And the reason you get the, he, he doesn't say, I think, therefore, I am in this is because back in the day, everybody used to write in both Latin and their home country language, and the cogito ergo sum is in the Latin version, but we're reading the translation from the French, so you're curious. Otherwise, whenever there's thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, whether correct or incorrect thoughts, there must be a thinker who's having those thoughts. And the fact of a thinker, according to Descartes, is a solid ground to begin seeking knowledge. This is uh, the, the fact that there is certainty involved, even if he doesn't know that he's a thinking thing yet, the certainty is enough to begin working towards knowledge because it's unlike every other object of his thought, of his conscious experience, of uh, his meditations. Um, and that all of those can be doubted through sense doubt, dreaming doubt, evil genius doubt. What is immune to all of that is the fact that he's a thinking thing. So how broad is the scope of the cogito? I am walking, therefore I exist. When you say that I could have made the same inference from any other one of my actions, meaning like I think therefore I am, I walk therefore I am, you are far from the truth. Since I'm not wholly certain of any of my actions with the sole exception of thought, I may not, for example, make the inference I'm walking, therefore I exist, except insofar as the awareness of walking is a thought. The inference, because the evil genius could make me think I'm walking when really I'm a brain in a vat. Um, the inference is certain only if applied to this awareness and not to the movement of the body, which sometimes, as in the case of dreams, is not occurring at all, despite the fact that I seem to myself to be walking. So we could say Descartes is thinking, therefore Descartes exists, or Ed Sheeran exists, because Ed Sheeran thinks if he ever does. Does anyone recognize the problem with this formulation, the second one? Anybody see what, why, why Descartes would object to Descartes thinking, therefore Descartes exists, or Ed Sheeran is thinking, therefore Ed Sheeran exists? Because Descartes and Ed Sheeran are not two, and I think they're not. Because Descartes and Ed Sheeran are not you, right? So we can't be certain of other people's existence because of their thinking, because we might be deceived into thinking that they're thinking, but I'm still the one thinking and being deceived. So I can at least say that with certainty, I'm being deceived, right? I exist. So the cogito at this stage of Descartes' meditations is an entirely private solipsistic affair. Um, for the sake of time, we'll skip that. Good. So Descartes said, I think therefore I am. And now the project of the rest of uh, meditations two, three is to say, what the heck I am? What, what, is, what is this thinking thing? What is it consistent? What, when I say that I am a thinking thing, can I derive any more information about myself from what is uh, around that inference, the inference of the cogito? What is the I that thinks? So after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. But I do not yet have sufficient understanding of what this I is that now necessarily exists. So I must be on guard against carelessly taking something else to be this I, and so making a mistake in the very item of knowledge that I maintain is the most certain and evident of all. So he said, look, I think, therefore I am, I exist, but I got to be really careful um, because I don't want to start mixing in uh, beliefs that aren't also causally connected through justification to that fundamental uncertainty. I need to be really careful about what I postulate about the eye that exists is so that everything continues to hold together so that as we grow our superstructure upon this cogito foundation, um, it'll all hold really strongly. It won't be dubitable. So what is the eye? Is it, is it a human? Well, no, we can't really say what this is. And 
again, we have the, the problem of walking and doubting bodies and stuff. So the I can't be the body because I might not have a body. The evil genius could be deceiving me away from um, the fact of my body. Am I a rational animal? Well, no, because rationality is a tricky concept, too hard to define. That doesn't reason or what reason is supposed to be doesn't strictly follow from the fact of my thinking and being potentially deceived proves the certainty of my existence, cogito. Um, so a rational animal or a uh, physical embodied extended animal, these, these aren't the right sorts of definitions for what that I consists in. So let me then focus, says Descartes, instead on the beliefs that spontaneously and naturally came to me whenever I thought about what I was. Um, so an appeal to indoxa, indoxa just means like belief. Uh, so what Aristotle would do in his uh, writings is start his writings with, here's what everybody kind of believes about stuff and here's what it gets right. And here's what we can do better with it. Um, and this is how he developed all sorts of interesting sciences and um, arguments and uh, uh, previous extrapolated upon previous arguments, metaphysical presuppositions to develop more sound, reasonable ones. Um, so now Descartes is going to do the same thing. What did I used to believe the self was and will these help me? Um, the first of these was that I have a body and the second of these is that I have a solar mind. But again, we saw that these are sorts of problems. These are the old beliefs, the, the unjustified ones that are probably true, right? But we don't know that they're true yet. Um, so we're going to set these aside as well. And so here we kind of get the beginning of Descartes is known as a dualist. So when we talked about um, Parmenides, we talked about monism, everything is one thing. We're starting to get a sense, a smell of Descartes' dualism, that there are two sorts of things, right? Monism, one thing, dualism, two things. So Descartes is going to tell us that there's substance, which is the basic building blocks of existing entities. Extension is how he's going to define substance, which we'll talk about with the melting wax of the candle example. And then um, there's mental stuff, which is like thinking. And this is an important move in um, all sorts of uh, philosophical traditions to justify the dualism, to say that there is a uh, physical extension and it is uh, metaphysically different, like different in kind uh, to um, like thinking substance, mental substance, because uh, you get all sorts of, what well, you get the mind body problem, right? So if the mind is a thinking object full of thinking substance that is completely unlike physical extended substance, how do they interact? How do they relate? How does the mind cause, the mind which is not physical cause a physical thing which is not mind to move? It's a huge question and one that persists to this day. Lots of interesting answers in literature on the mind-body problem. So says Descartes, but now I'm supposing that there's a supremely malicious deceiver who has set out to trick me in every way he can. Now, what shall I say about what I am? Well, not body, not rational animal, because I could be the brain in the vat. I could just be a floating ethereal who knows what. At last, I have discovered it, thought. Thinking is the one thing that cannot be separated from me. I am, I exist, this is certain, but for how long? For as long as I am thinking, for as long as he is thinking, he knows that he exists, or it's certain that, it, that he exists. Strictly speaking then, I'm simply a thing that thinks, a mind or soul, intellect or reason. So what is the I that is proven, says Descartes, in the cogito, the cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. The I is thinking stuff. I am a thinking thing, says Descartes. But if I'm a thinking thing, what does that entail? Well, uh, does it entail objects of my imagination? Um, no, says Descartes. Uh, the imagination can be any number of things. I can imagine a unicorn, but I'm not a unicorn. I can imagine uh, a water bottle, but I'm not a water bottle. It's something more than that. But the property of imagination might be a part of what the eye is, but the objects of imagination are not. And moreover, the, the objects of imagination rely on experience in the world, which could all be deceived in order to reconstruct objects of uh, sensation into uh, objects of mind and imagination. Um, so I'm like seeing something in my head, right? Um, I have to have experienced the world and all of that world could be either a dream or um, deceived by the evil genius. 
So Descartes says, I cannot claim to be um, any object of imagination, but uh, surely can be a thing that imagines, right? That has a power of imagination in general. So we get a sort of taxonomy of mind that the thinking thing is the, the eye that can doubt, that can understand, affirm, deny, want, refuse, imagine, and seems to perceive the world. That all of this, these processes related to thinking, generalizable, um, are uh, what the, the eye is, what the thinking thing is, even if the objects of them might be deceived. But it's at least certain that these uh, affect, affective mental states, these uh, mental capacities are um, associated with the thinking thing that is the mind that exists as long as it is thinking. So it is the same eye who senses or is aware of bodily things seemingly through the senses. Because I may be dreaming, I can't say for sure that I now see the flames, hear the wood crackling and feel the heat of the fire, but it certainly seems to me to hear and to be warmed. This cannot be false. Right? It can't be false that it seems to me. Um, it might be false that it actually is warming me, that I'm actually sitting by the fire, but it can't be false that it seems to me that uh, this is the case, says Descartes. Um, what is called sensing is strictly just this seeming. And when sensing is understood in this restricted sense of the word, it too is simply thinking. So through thinking alone, Descartes is going to begin to derive certain facts about the body. So he's going to take this natural light that illuminates uh, the fact of his thinking, uh, allowing him or, or causing him to infer the fact of an eye that exists on the basis of that thinking to, again, expanding this light of certainty to properties of thought, of what thinking consists in, to now soon to be the objects about which that thinking is concerned. So objects of body, of physical corporeal existence. So our, our scope is widening as, as we um, have we set the foundation and, and Descartes is building his superstructure and it grows taller or wider, whatever metaphor you want to use. So what certain facts do we have at this point? Well, we know that something can't come from nothing. This was sort of like an assumed premise at the very beginning of things. It came in the argument that made up the cogito. We know that uh, I am a thinking thing, um, but from this, what can we learn about the body? And so here we get uh, the end of meditation to the melting candle wax example. So the, the candle has uh, presumably a taste. It doesn't write about chewing on the candle, but we can imagine it's possible to taste the candle. It has a certain smell of honeycomb or whatever Descartes says about it. It um, feels kind of waxy to the touch. Um, it looks long and rigid, though maybe melty around the bottom. Uh, it has a particular shape. It's a cylinder, right? Um, these are physical properties that the candle has until it melts. Once it melts, it doesn't have any of the same physical properties that it used to. But what exactly is this thing that I'm now imagining? Well, if we take away whatever doesn't belong to the wax, what is left is merely something extended, flexible, and changeable. So take away the smell, take away the shape, take away uh, the color and the taste. Um, all of these properties are changeable, right? The wax no longer resembles what it once did uh, in any sensory capacity, but where Descartes says it would be crazy to say, nobody says that that's a different wax. It's still the same wax, of course. So what is the property that consists, that, that persists through the wax as it changes all of its perceptual properties? Well, um, I'm forced to conclude that uh, it's extended, flexible, and changeable, that body is physical extension. It's none of these secondary properties, as Locke would call them, um, smell, touch, taste, feel, but extension itself. What what it is to be physical is to be extended in the world because the extension remains the same. Um, even though the, the properties that adhere in that extension, like shape and whatnot, um, change, the wax remains the same. So I'm forced to conclude that the nature of the piece of wax isn't revealed by my imagination, but is perceived by the mind alone. So the imagination is what's putting together the shape and the smell and the, uh, what, what other properties do I have? The, the touch of it, the waxiness. I have all of these physical perceptual sensations, multimodal, and my imagination takes each as a discrete element and combines them all and says, that's a candle. 
right? But then they all go away, right? All of those properties change or disappear when the candle melts. And yet I still say that it's the same, it's the same wax. What is the property that, that is in the candle that allows me to say that um, the, the wax is the same? Well, it's none of its secondary properties. Um, it's something about the, the conceptual nature of the wax. It's that my mind has the ability to directly perceive something about the wax that isn't uh, perceptually present in it, that isn't represented by my like, ability to touch, taste, smell, feel, see it. Um, but the mind grasps the fact that the wax remains the same, even though it loses all these properties. So now <clears throat> we have from Descartes a connection between uh, or from the certainty of the thing that thinks this mental object out into the world via extension. So body is extension and bodies are judged as if seen by the mind alone. The mind directly apprehends it, directly apperceives objects in the world as extended. And so we can begin to extend or see how uh, the, the superstructure of belief might extend itself now out into the physical world as long as it is being judged in the right sort of way by my, the mind. And this is important Descartes lingo. It's clear and distinct. So I've been talking a lot about like the natural light and certainty. There's a certain property of uh, what it's like to think about uh, certain things like the fact that I, I think therefore I am or that I am a thinking thing or that body's extended is that these sorts of thoughts uh, are clear and distinct. Um, they're not muddy, they're not shook up, they're not uh, dubitable in any sort of way. Um, and as long as a belief is clear and distinct, then we can trust it, says Descartes. So what I see might not really be the wax. Perhaps I don't even have eyes with which to see anything. But when I see or think I see, it is simply not possible that uh, I, I, who I am now thinking, am not something. Similarly, that I exist follows from all the other bases for judging that the wax exists, that I touch it, that I imagine it, or any other basis. And similarly, for my bases for judging that anything else exists outside of me. As I came to perceive the wax more clearly and distinctly by applying not just sight and touch, but other considerations, all this too contributed to knowing myself even more distinctly, because whatever goes into my perception of the wax or any other body must do even more to establish the nature of my own mind. So insofar as the certainty, the, cl the clarity and distinctness of the, that, that is present in the cogito is able to extend out and widen the scope of, of certainty into other objects in the world, that those objects in the world that are clear and distinct that also have a reflective power um, to illuminate more of what that I is, what the, the thinking thing is that exists. And so we're gonna see this back and forth, this bounce back. So the mind shoots out and, and perceives, and if it perceives clearly and distinctly, like about the extension of body, um, then the extension of body becomes a clear and distinct property that uh, is indubitable in the set of uh, superstructural beliefs that um, comes from this foundation. And this is gonna be how Descartes bounces sort of back and forth in order to construct an empirical world on the basis of material science that is justifiable, that doesn't regress infinitely, that has a foundation in um, uh, uh, first principles. So a clear and distinct object of thought is one that could be known with the same certainty as I think I exist. And as long as we get this pinging back and forth, that uh, scope, the domain of things that contain this clearness and distinctness, will continue to grow. And it seems that I think I exist is not the only object of thought that's clear and distinct. There's also the idea that bodies are extended substances. But just because we have clear and distinct ideas doesn't mean that we know them yet, right? It just means that we don't doubt them. We can't doubt them. We can't help but to think that they're certain. But that doesn't mean that we know them, right? We could still be in a lot of trouble with the evil demon, the evil genius. It's still possible, right? That if anything, says Descartes, is gonna count as knowledge, our best bet, if anything could be a first principle, the best bet is whatever is clear and distinct. Because there's all sorts of other beliefs that like what a rational being is supposed to be or like whether I have a body or any of that stuff, right? If candles necessarily have a smell of honeycomb or whatever, the, these are all muddy ideas, but the clarity and distinctness 
if any of my beliefs are going to count as knowledge, they should also have this property of being clear and distinct. Because certainty doesn't equal knowledge. So in order for Descartes to get the final piece of the puzzle, to raise the um, clear and distinct objects of thought to the level of knowledge, we need one final piece, which is God. Right? And this is what happens in meditations four through six. We get Descartes' proof for God, uh, which the way it works in the, in the meditations is that um, Descartes says, look, here's my proof for God, the ontological proof, which we'll look at later in the semester. Just assume for Descartes, God exists. The proof is valid um, for now. Um, so if God exists, the sort of God uh, would, um, the, the existence of God is clear and distinct. And the existence of that God would make it impossible for there to be an evil genius, evil deceiver, because that like all good, omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient God wouldn't allow me to be deceived when I think um, with such clarity and distinctness. Uh, therefore, what I think with clarity and distinctness is stuff that I can know, because there's no evil genius. So there's no reason to doubt anymore. My clear and distinct thoughts become indubitable um, and as long as we use the scientific method, uh, we can produce more clear and distinct thoughts uh, and do science and have knowledge and build back the rest of our beliefs that we threw out, probably losing those ones that don't stand up to the rigor of um, clarity and distinctness. So that's the rest of the meditations. Um, interesting stuff. It remains just as fun. We're not going to look at it. Uh, in this class. We'll look at a form of ontological proof, but we won't see it any more than that little, like, you know, nutshell that I just gave you. Um, so that's that. That's the end. Um, I will stop the recording. Goodbye, future students. <laughs>